and before we get to you know, what you're writing in the book. There have been a lot of times in history, in American history, when people write and speak out against religion. Mark Twain, Ingersoll, of course, John Dewey, and other humanists of the turn of the last century, Bertrand Russell here and in the UK. But never has there been this kind of public attention. Do you think that this, rather than just being a best-selling phenomenon, is it really helping crystallize a movement? In other words, is religion now finally on its way out because of this phenomenon? I think religion is um, ineradicable. I think it is part of our makeup. Not all of us, but of a large number of people, I think it can be said that they have an innate wish to believe. An innate wish to believe further that they're the center of the universe. Um, an inborn fear of death, to which religion caters very cleverly, rather cynically. And other things that predispose people towards uh, the religious view of the world. But that world view has now been so comprehensively subverted by discoveries in psychology, in biology, and in physics, that it will never be possible to assert faith in quite the simple-minded, absolutist way that it used to be possible to do. And I think further, speaking again of the zeitgeist, that since the horrifying assault on civil society mounted by jihadists, by faith-based murderers and theocrats, <clears throat> and given the willingness of some religious forces still to contest the findings of, of Darwin and of Einstein, a large number of people in the academy and elsewhere have decided that they'll have to come out into the arena and defend science and reason from the assault upon it. To see you on uh, uh, Chris Matthews last week on Hardball against Sharpton, it was great. It was really funny and engaging, but there was also something farcical about it. Middle America turns on the show. I imagine uh, they're looking at this Englishman in sunglasses speaking funny quips against their God belief. It must be really surreal to them. Is this what you had in mind when you wrote the book, when you imagined getting out there on a, on a book tour? Is this all there is for it? Well, no, it, it's my second debate with the Reverend Sharpton, who, of course, is, is always willing to uh, come out to defend uh, not religion as it happens, because he knows as much about that as he does about the dark side of the moon or any other topic, but at least to give himself a chance to orate in public. Nonetheless, my, my line is I'll take all comers, and that's included up till now a, a Buddhist nun in Florida. Of course, some people say Buddhism isn't really a religion, but it is kind of a faith. Um, several Baptist ministers, several rabbis, and many, many others in prospect, including in the fall in Washington, Alistair McGrath, who is believed by the Episcopalian Anglican community to be their senior theologian. So we'll see. We haven't started yet. I'd like to let our listeners know that you can get a copy of God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything through our website, pointofinquiry.org. Christopher Hitchens, uh, let's finally get to some of the specifics of the book. You say in the book that the New Testament is worse than the Old Testament. To me, Jesus' token economy in the Sermon on the Mount, his litany of rewards and punishments, it's always seemed rotten to me, immoral. But everybody says, you know, leave out the supernaturalism. At least Jesus said moral things. Yes, I'm a great hero of mine. Well, I try not to have heroes, but one can't obviously quite avoid using the word. Someone whom I have a great admiration, Thomas Jefferson, whose biographer I am. Uh, did, in fact, produce a Bible with the um, supernatural and magical and irrational bits cut out with a razor blade, and uh, which he said left us with moral teachings. I think that's far too naive. I quote C.S. Lewis, in fact, against the Christians here by citing one of the very few honest and intelligent things he ever said. He said that the teachings of Jesus were actually insane unless you made the assumption that he was the Son of God. You see, this makes it harder for people to separate the supernatural and the magical from the moral, because if a preacher goes around saying, leave your family, take no thought for the morrow, give no thought to thrift or investment or clothing or your children, give everything up and follow me, that's only moral if you think that the world is about to come to an end and that this preacher uh, knows what to do when that happens. If you don't make that assumption, then the teaching isn't moral at all. I'd further add, I do add in the book, that full as it is, uh, of atrocity and murder and racism and slavery, all these things, by the way, being recommended, not condemned. The Old Testament uh, still doesn't mention hell. There's no punishment of the dead, let alone eternal torture of the dead in the Old Testament. It's only when you get gentle Jesus, meek and mild, 
the shepherd and the sheep, that the idea is introduced that if you don't accept his mild and adorable message, you're going to be very sorry. Um, this is wickedness, of course, of the highest order. Incidentally, I remember one of my first reactions when I was quite small to the teaching of Christianity was, I hate having to call myself a sheep. What does it say of a religion that it actually describes its own followers as if they were a flock? <laughs> and why do shepherds look after sheep? Not because they like them, though actually some shepherds, it seems, like them far too much, but <laughs> in order to first fleece them and then kill them. It's actually a perfect analogy of what the relationship of religion to its uh, credulous believers really is. Tell me how religion is bad for your health. It's bad for your physical and mental health, in my opinion. Uh, I'll do it in reverse order. For mental health, it's very important to have a wholesome attitude towards sexuality. All of um, religion's preachings are of the opposite kind. They regard the sexual instinct as, in a sense, a curse. It may be necessary for reproduction, but that's it. Something to be repressed, especially in women, and viewed with disgust and alarm. This has made many, many, many people miserable and unhealthy for hundreds and indeed thousands of years. I think genital mutilation is not good for your physical health, uh, that it's outrageous to practice uh, mutilation on people who aren't old enough to elect for the surgery. If there's going to be genital mutilation, circumcision as it's sometimes called, then it should be embarked upon voluntarily by grown-ups. It's child abuse to do it any other way. Those are just two salient examples. They both have to do, of course, with the sexual terror, of which religion is an example. So if everyone became more sex positive, it, let's say religion changed just so that everyone became a little more sex positive, would you have as big an issue with people believing other things that are untrue, like God's in the universe and he's looking out for you? Um, that wouldn't make that argument any more intelligent. That caters to something else that probably isn't good for us, though, while we're at it. I mean, the, the belief that we are the center of the universe and that the stars and the galaxies and the nebulae operate with us in mind and were designed with us in mind is, of course, an appeal to our solipsism, to our self-centeredness. It's the same stupidity, and I think stupidity is not harmless because it's so easily exploited, that leads people to consult their astrological charts. It's essentially morally the same. Right. My last question was getting at where your ire is coming from. Is it just that people believe stuff you think is nonsense or the fact that they think nonsense is so bad for society? And I think you just said the latter is the case. Yes, I think one, <clears throat> of course, it would be open to me to write a merely satirical book as someone, say, like uh, Julia Sweeney does a satirical broadcast saying these, these are the weird things these people actually believe. This needs ironic and satirical treatment. Why not? You know, it's amusing. And um, if you're a good comedian or even a halfway good comedian, it's a target-rich environment. That would be enough in one way if it were not for the very deadly threat the religion now poses to us. I mean, just look, for example, at what the parties of God are doing to, to reduce Iraq to the level of an Afghanistan or a Somalia, the last two countries where the parties of God had things all their own way, or reflect on the messianic mullahs who think that the 12th imam is about to reveal himself and bring the world to an end, and who for an insurance policy are acquiring apocalyptic weaponry. That's a very unsettling conclusion. Or the um, uh, diseased and deranged uh, Jewish settlers on the West Bank of the River Jordan who think that by stealing other people's land and property, they can bring on their version of the Messiah. And their friends in America, the Christian right, who, of course, uh, believe in the bodily rapture of believers leaving the rest of us to welter in hell, um, who are Jew baiters and racists of the old tradition, and who will not give up the stupid idea that they can legislate their morality and their teachings in schools and destroy the, the science class uh, in their own interest. It's really time for a fight back against this kind of nonsense and wickedness. Speaking of the fight back against that wickedness, I've heard a lot of people over the years rail against